So this lecture is about carbohydrates, which is our first biomolecule. Um, some of the carbohydrates that you see on the side here we're going to talk about, but it's not really that you need to memorize a specific carbohydrate so much as I want you to be able to recognize, uh, know how to recognize a carbohydrate uh, as compared to other biomolecules. So let's first talk about what do carbohydrates do in biological organisms. Probably the one that people are most uh, well familiar with would be energy. Carbohydrates are your body's form of, or source of immediate energy. So when you're running the mile, when you need a lot of energy really quickly, that's the, the body's first um, place that it goes for energy. In addition, um, cells have on the outsides of them some carbohydrates, and those are used for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. And there are other um, roles as well that carbohydrates will play, but we're not going to get too much into that right now because today we're really kind of focusing more on how do I recognize a carbohydrate and what are the main properties of that biomolecule. So let's start with the monomer. Remember, all biomolecules are going to be made up of monomers strung together to be polymers. So the monomer of the carbohydrate is the monosaccharide. Some examples of uh, monosaccharides would be, for example, the ones you see here. So glucose, galactose, fructose, ribose, ribulose, those are all monosaccharides. And you can string them together to get more complex carbohydrates. The nice thing is the way that you recognize a carbohydrate is it's really very uh, formulaic. It's very basic. You're always going to find the same ratio. It should be a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen, meaning I should have the same number of carbons and oxygens, and I should have twice as many hydrogens, right? So, for example, glucose is a good example, C6H12O6. Six carbons, six oxygens, but twice as many hydrogens, so C6H12O6. And it doesn't have to be a perfect 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. If it's pretty close, and that you know it's probably a carbohydrate. And again, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do on your next quiz is to recognize uh, what kind of biomolecule something is just by looking at the structure. So this is a really easy way to figure out if something is a carbohydrate. You simply count the carbons, count the oxygens, count the hydrogens, and see if you have that one to two to one ratio. Let's go back for a second. Now, remember, the whole idea with biomolecules is that you string them together, right? So the, the next level up of complexity would be a disaccharide. Di means two. So in this case, it means when you string two monosaccharides together. Some of the key disaccharides in the past the AP exam wanted you to know, but I don't think is really that crucial anymore, but I'm just going to use them as an example, are the following. I could take, and again, the idea is I string together different monosaccharides, and depending on what I string together, I get a certain disaccharide. So I could get fructose and glucose would give me sucrose, or I could have glucose and galactose give me lactose. Lactose is the sugar in milk. Or if I string together two glucoses, I would get maltose, which is also a pretty common uh, sugar that you'll find in food. What we're going to kind of focus on more here, though, is not necessarily memorizing the disaccharides so much as knowing how do we create those disaccharides from our monosaccharides. And this is where those reactions that we talked about the other day come into play. If I'm going to string together two monosaccharides, that means I need to form a new bond. The specific name of that bond is called a glycosidic linkage or a glycosidic bond. So that's the bond that has to be formed between two monosaccharides in order to create a disaccharide. Take a minute then, and looking back at your notes or seeing what you remember, what kind of reaction then would form this bond? Would it be a dehydration synthesis reaction, or it would, be, would it be a hydrolysis reaction? Because we are building something, then this is going to have to be a dehydration synthesis reaction, right? Because we're trying to build a larger molecule from our two individual monosaccharides. And if you look right here, this is where you see that new glycosidic bond or glycosidic linkage happening, right? It's between a carbon and an oxygen. So again, I want you to reference the tables on page, I believe it's 16 and 17. 
of your course notes to figure out what kind of bond is that. Well, when I look at the carbon to oxygen electronegativity difference, you should see that it is a polar covalent bond. So this is also while we're, how we're making some connections between some of the chemistry stuff we already talked about, and now I'm getting more into the biological molecules. So this right here, this is that glycosidic bond. Good example of something formed through dehydration synthesis, and what forms is a polar covalent bond. Now, this is the basis, this glycosidic link is the basis for really building any number of monosaccharides linked together. So now we're going to just talk about, okay, so disaccharide is two, but what happens to you get more complex? Well, technically the next level up would be what we call an oligosaccharide, which is just to say many monosaccharides strung together. But we're going to skip past that to talk about instead really the highest level, the more, most complicated, the most monosaccharides strung together, which would be polysaccharides. <coughs> and there's a few different um, polysaccharides I need you to know about. We're going to start with starch and glycogen. <coughs> starch you're going to find in plants, and glycogen you're going to find in animals like us. Both are a form of stored energy. So it's not the immediate energy, but rather it's a form of stored energy. Starch is the energy storage in plants. You're going to find a lot of it, for example, in like potatoes and a lot of times in like roots of plants. Glycogen is energy storage in animals, and that's going to be found in your liver and in your muscles. The idea is this is sort of like money you've saved in the bank. And so the idea is that when your body needs additional energy, your body can actually release enzymes that will break the bonds between the monosaccharides in the starch and the glycogen, and that will release the energy so that it can be used now by your cells for cellular respiration. <coughs> now, remember last time we talked about structure and function, so this is where we're going to see some of that come into play. We're going to start first by talking about the structure of starch and glycogen, the physical structure. If you look at this picture right here, uh, amylopectin is a type of starch, it's on the left, glycogen is on the right. What you hopefully see in common with these two pictures is the branching. <coughs> Both starch and glycogen have a branch structure. And it's a little hard to see in this picture, but basically if you look at each of these biomolecules, each of those little individual dots that are making up these branches is a monosaccharide. So you can see that the way that these monosaccharides are strung together is in a branch structure. What I want you to take a minute to think about then is how does the branch structure support the function of these molecules? So think about what starch is for, what glycogen is for, and think about why might having this structure support its particular function. You can pause the video right now if you need to, or you can, you already think you know, and you can also go ahead and move forward, of course. Well, remember, both starch and glycogen are for energy, right? The idea is that when I need that energy, I want to be able to release it, break it out. So the branch structure really supports the function, because think about now, if each of these little dots is a monosaccharide. With all these branches, I have lots of places that I can break off a monosaccharide and get the energy. As opposed to if it was just one long string, right, all I would be able to do is break off one end and the other end. So really, the branching allows for more points of access for those enzymes. That enzyme can break off here, 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 here. All Every branch can have an enzyme breaking it off at the same time. So that's going to yield greater surface area. With more surface area, that means I'm going to be able to break off that energy faster and be able to get to it faster. Hence, I'm going to actually be able to use it faster. So one way I like to think about it is to think about it sort of almost like an ATM, right? If your bank only had like a single bank that you could go to, it would be really hard for you to go to the ATM to get money out. But if instead it's like Wells Fargo or Chase or one of those banks or Bank of America where you see them all over the place, again, you have much greater access to 
the money, in this case the money would be the, the glucose, the, the, um, the monosaccharide. So this is a good example of structure function though, right? Because the physical branch structure of starch and glycogen really supports their function of providing energy. The other type of polysaccharide I want you to know about is a little bit different. This is cellulose and chitin. It is pronounced chitin and not chitin. And these now are polysaccharides that are for structural support. So they're not for energy. Instead, cellulose is what you find in the cell walls of all plants. So it really kind of helps, literally helps it have its physical structure and stand up. And chitin is actually the polysaccharide that makes up the hard exoskeleton insects. So remember, insects have an exoskeleton, whereas we have an endoskeleton. Where we have our bones on the inside, <clears throat> they don't. So they end up with that hard outer shell, which is made of chitin. So these, again, two polysaccharides now for structural support. Now, again, I want you to kind of think about looking at the picture here, how might you expect the structure to support the function. You can already kind of see the structure in the picture, but let's kind of walk through it right now. Cellulose and chitin both have long unbranched chains. So think of almost like a rope. And like that rope is made up of like little fibers all sort of combined together. Right, so the fibers form parallel chains. Again, what I want you to think about is how does this physical structure now support these molecule-specific functions? Again, you can either stop the tape, or if you think you know, you can go through. Let's just move forward. Well, <clears throat> if you think about those long unbranched chains, again, it's sort of like fibers, sort of forming a rope or something. You can kind of see how that would actually be very, very strong, right? Those long unbranched chains really provide a great deal of strength, especially when you put them all together. And um, then that's really going to allow for the cellulose and the chitin to do their job in this case, which is to sort of uh, keep things together and, you know, and not, um, and, and allow for that strength of, of you know, it is sort of that fiber, those parallel fibers all together. Again, another good example of structure and function. So hopefully this kind of gives you a nice introduction into carbohydrates. Um, if you were to take physiology next year, then you will learn about other aspects of carbohydrates, like how fast it gets into your bloodstream and whatnot. For our purposes today, we're really just focusing on what is the main information about these particular biomolecules and how we recognize it.